also probably great wealth. So I keep looking at I keep looking at what do they get out of the situation that's particularly relevant for what we're studying in here. My wife's in business. Uh, she's a big time business person. And she always says to me constantly, she says, follow the money, follow the money. It's like, yeah, that's pretty much it. Follow the money. What'd you get out of it? So what causes aggression? You could turn that into a hypothesis, which is, I know, uh, monetary rewards uh, may reward aggression. We could, we could test that out. Anyway, the hypothesis is a, is a question just turned into a declarative statement that you can test in an experiment. Remember that? In an experiment. And then you collect data in your experiment. And uh, that's the empirical part. We're using deductive logic over here, moving from the general to the particular. And then we come out of here, we got laws, in chapter two. And then they feed into theories. Laws are reliably observed relationships between um, events in the world out there. And if they're really reliable, then we call them a law. There are some laws in psychology. We're going to be talking about them here, believe it or not. Um, so anyway, science, theory, experiments. And uh, I mentioned you need to be familiar with, it, with the, the functions of theory, that they both synthesize and integrate lots of information. And a good theory would have heuristic value as well. It would spur future research. It would encourage future research, cause you to ask more questions. And remember, a good theory is a dynamic one. It's one that's open to change. It's always changing to accommodate new information coming in. Now, you need to know about independent, dependent variable. Did we talk about all of those, those things in here? No? Well, all right. Here's your basic experiment. How many of you have had research methods already? Raise your hand if you've had research methods. Huh, that's interesting. I guess I expected most of you have already had that. Um, I'm going to give you an outline for the most basic kind of experiment. For those of you who had research methods, hopefully you're going to sit there and go, oh yeah, I remember that. And if you haven't had it, then this is new for you. First, you define a population. And what I'm talking about here is discussed very briefly on pages 17 and 18 of chapter 2, kind of in this area. Um, a basic experiment, in a basic experiment, you define a population. It's usually a large group of people, because we're interested in humans here. Uh, but you can define them any way you want. It could be all the people in the world. If you're a person in the world, you're in my population. Um, how about this? All of the U.S. citizens. If you're a citizen of the United States, I didn't necessarily say living here, just if you're a U.S. citizen, you're in my population. How about all of the students enrolled at Pan Am this semester? Sure, why not? How about everybody's in this classroom right now? Yeah, what I'm, my point is a population can be really large, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. But if you, you define it based on some characteristic, and every event that has that characteristic is a member of your population. Now, if we we're talking about all of the students enrolled at Pan Am this semester, and I wanted to conduct an experiment on them, well, let's see, I think we just broke 20,000 as enrollment for this semester. For the first time, broke 20,000. So, <clears throat> seems like that take a long time to get everybody in this university. 20,000 people coming to my experiment, running them through the thing. I mean, even if it only took 30 minutes, let's see, that'd be 20,000. That'd be 10,000 hours. That's a lot of time. Might take me a decade, you know. So that wouldn't be very practical. So generally speaking, we go get ourselves a sample, which is a smaller group of people. Now, how should we select this sample? Should we just start with all of you people in this classroom? Random. Random. Who said that? Have you, have you had research methods? I'm taking it right now. Uh, ah. <laughs> so you've probably just been discussing that maybe fairly recently. Well, uh, let me ask you this. We go downtown McAllen. We want to know what the general popular, the, the public thinks here in the valley about uh, what Assad is doing. So I go down on uh, 17th Street, let's say, Friday night. Okay, it's happening. There's a bunch of people down there. 
And so I go up to the first person I see on the street there, and I say, excuse me, um, let me ask you a question. What do you think about Assad? Should we bomb Syria? What do you think? And they say, yes, bomb the heck out of that guy. He's crazy. We need to bomb him. And the next person comes along, and I say, excuse me, let me ask you a question. What do you think? Should we bomb Syria? And they say, no, don't bomb Syria. Use diplomacy. So I do that for about 10 people. And let's say that I get 7 out of 10 say we should use diplomacy, and 3 of them say let's bomb the heck out of them. Okay? Now, can I make statements? Well, let me ask you this. Is that a random sample? Yeah. Who said that? Why not? That I'm asking just people as they randomly walk down the street. It's a convenient sample. It's like a, a person like in one like central area. So you're getting like clever kids. So like, okay, so so but th doesn't their opinion count? Yes, but not if you're going to generalize it. Aha, uh -huh, that's the key. You use the word generalize. Now those ten people, who do they represent? <laughs> clever kids. The what? Clevers, randoms. Yes. They represent those 10 people. That's it. End of story. Nobody else. They represent those 10 people. That's it. I wouldn't even, I don't, I wouldn't even generalize it to clubbers. I would say the only people they represent are themselves. Now, if I wanted to have ask them questions to find out how clubbers feel, I'd have to get all the clubbers together and then randomly pick a sample from the clubbers. Because there are going to be some clubbers that maybe I just don't run into that night. The, the definition of a random sample, which is really important, is that all elements of the population had an equal probability of being selected for the sample. And if I define it as clubbers on 17th Street, everybody who's a clubber <laughs> that night would have to have an equal chance of me asking them that question. But they didn't. So... The, so those 10 people, their, their opinion counts, but it only represents them, okay? So we can't make statements about clubbers based on those 10 folks. We could if we had a true random sample of clubbers. Well, here's the kicker, you know, like uh, they used to have on the news these Instapol things. They'd say, well, call in tonight at uh, 6 o'clock. Call in and tell us what you think about whether we should bomb Syria or not, and then they come back <coughs> at 10 o'clock and they say, well, 70% uh, of the people that called in said that we should use diplomacy, and 30% uh, of them said that we should bomb Syria. Now, the problem with that is, that is that I think most people watching television that aren't educated, and even some semi-educated people, are going to sit there and go, wow, 70% of the people in the valley. No, no. It's not 70% of the people in the valley. It's, first of all, you may not even know how many people called the Instapol thing. It could have been 20 folks, uh, or it could have been 200, but it doesn't matter. They don't, they'll, all they represent are themselves. That's it, period. You could not make any statement about the valley. Because everybody in the valley would have to have an equal chance of being selected for the sample. Some people don't own telephones. They got no chance. Some people would never call in. They have no chance. So what I really get a little bit sometimes uh, irritated is when, when programs present information like that as though it has some sort of a basis in, uh, in uh, well, they, they sort of, it's misleading. It's misleading, that's the problem. Now, you'll notice that when you hear a Gallup poll or some of these other polls, they'll say, they will tell you how it was sampled. They will tell you what the sample size is, et cetera. That's okay. But these instapoles are useless. And I don't even think they do that anymore, but for a while they were doing it. Random sample. Now, if you got a random sample, that means that every element, every person in this sample here, you could generalize the results of your experiment to this population, which would be good. That'd be good. That means you don't, I don't have to get every student at Pan Am in my experiment. I can conduct an experiment with 50 people from Pan Am, but I can still make statements about the average behavior of Pan Am students. I could generalize, make inferences back to the population if you've got a random sample. Now you take this random sample divided into two smaller groups. Here they are. Let me ask you this. Suppose I try a new teaching technique in this class, speaking of learning. And you all get A's. Can I conclude that my new teaching technique caused you to get A's? Why not? I tried my new technique out, you all got A's. 
You don't have a control? What, what control? What do you mean? What is the control group? You try the regular teaching techniques on one group. Why not? I used my new technique and you all got A's. Although you wouldn't know just what caused to get A's. Why not? You have nothing to compare it to. So why do I need to compare it to something? Why do I need to compare it to this control group you're talking about? You're right, but my question is why? Why do you need that compared to the other? To see if that changes in the one that you Oh, you mean it's possible that, that they can, if I used my old technique, everybody could have got an A also? Oh, but you need something to compare it to. <laughs> why? I used my new technique, y'all got A's. To make sure you just don't have the classroom full of geniuses. Like you don't need to Thank you. Yes, you do need a control group that they're talking about. You need an anchor or a reference point to compare the, the new technique group to. But why is that? Because it's possible if I did, if I use my old technique, you all got A's anyway. It's possible that I got a room full of geniuses, or it's possible that I got a room full of really smart psych students, and you all would have got A's anyhow. You don't know if the new technique had any effect on the students unless you are able to compare it to people you leave alone. You don't do anything to them. You use the old technique and you see if, if they all get A's. Um, so, you were right. I'm just trying to tease out of you why is it you need that anchor. And the reason you need it is to see how do people behave if you just leave them alone. Then you do something to them and you see if it affects them differently than if you just leave them alone. And when I say alone, I'm talking about like a traditional, my traditional teaching method versus my new method. Well, it's completely arbitrary which group is going to get the new technique because I'm going to randomly assign subjects to these two groups. So we got random selection over here. You know, it's interesting. I'm glad we had that little talk <laughs> because. A lot of times people will say that, you know, well, you need a, you need to uh, control group, you know, but when I start pressing them on why you need that, very often people are sometimes like, oh, well, I don't know, but uh, you need one. Uh, random, you randomly select people from the population here, the equal probability again in here, and then you randomly assign them here. So we got random assignment. We've got randomness all over the place here. Now we randomly assign subjects to these two groups, which is to say each person in the sample has an equal probability of getting into either one of these groups. They could just as well be here or over here. Random assignment. Why do we do that? Why do we want to make sure that they are randomly assigned to these two groups at the beginning? Research method students. To eliminate bias. What's that? To eliminate bias. This is true. What kind of bias? What are you talking about? You're right, but what kind of bias? Well, maybe the attitude uh, toward the sample. Okay. Okay. Anything else that we want to eliminate? Any other kind of bias? Past educational experience or level of education, <coughs> age, <coughs> gender. Intelligence level? Researcher bias. What? Researcher bias. Uh, that would not really affect researcher bias. What we're talking about here is what we call subject variables or organismic variables. Uh, bias in the subject when they come to the experiment. And uh, there's all kinds of bias. It could be, uh, what did you say? On the attitude. Oh, attitudes, attitudes. It could be their attitudes, it could be their personality characteristics, it could be their age, whatever. If it's, a, if it's a characteristic you possess as a subject when you show up to the experiment, we want to make sure they're evenly distributed in these two groups. And so that, in a way, it equates the two groups. So they're equal at the beginning of this experiment. Right? So we've got some really intelligent people here, some intelligent people here, some stupid people here, some stupid people here. We got some tall people here, tall people here, etc. Certain attitudes here, certain attitudes here. It's evenly distributed. That's why you randomly assign them to the two groups. Now, which group is, should be the experimental group that's going to get the new teaching technique? 
It's arbitrary. It doesn't matter because the two groups are equal at the beginning. Pick one. I don't care. Let's say this one. This becomes what we call the experimental group <coughs> or treatment group sometimes it's called. And uh, this is the control group, but it's arbitrary. Now, for the experimental group, we're going to give them the treatment. Okay, it's going to be the new technique. I'm going to just put an X here for that's when we apply the new, you know, new teaching technique. And this group, old technique, I just leave them alone. I just teach them the regular way. And at the end, uh, we have to measure some behavior. And by the way, this treatment that we're talking about, we call that the independent variable. And that brings us to chapter two in the book. The treatment is the independent variable. Uh, this group gets new technique, new teaching. By the way, the independent variable here is teaching technique. The experimental group is the new technique. The control group is the old technique. But what's the independent variable? Teaching method, teaching technique. New technique, old technique. Uh, I don't want you to go away thinking that the control group doesn't get any. Yeah, they, they get the old teaching method. This one gets the new teaching method here. Now, we got to measure their behavior to find out if this teaching method had any effect on them. So, um, you know, as in cause and effect. And this is the presumed cause, like as long as we're talking about determinism. There is the presumed cause, and we presume it's going to have an effect on the subjects. It's going to affect them in some way. And uh, so what is it we should measure if we're using a teaching method? Maybe, let's say, their uh, final course grade. Yeah, the final course grade. I mean, that's one variable we could measure, course grade. Got my hair writing. It's just getting horrible. There we go. It's the rain. I'm sure it's that. Uh, <laughs> Of what I know. I'm not doing an experiment on it. Uh, we could, though. We could find out what sort of grades I assign on rainy days versus nice days. <coughs> and then we could manipulate the climate and see if my grades <laughs> change. Sure, we could figure that out. Anyway, course grades, but I'm talking about the mean. Remember that? X bar, arithmetic average. The average course grade for each group. Then we compare the average grade for each group. And we see if there's any difference. Let's suppose we find out that my new teaching method, on average, their grades went down. I know you're expecting me to say their grades went up. No, let's say their grades went down. <laughs> and uh, lower, statistically speaking, than the uh, old method right here. Then what can we conclude? <coughs> Well, it caused a decrease in their average grade. I don't think I'd stick. I don't think I'd use the new method anymore then. But the, the this is called the dependent variable, by the way. It's the behavior that you're measuring. Dependent variable is the behavior you measure, and this is, by the way, the effect. Cause and effect, determinism, antecedent causes and effects. This is a, uh, actually, this little diagram right here illustrates the most fundamental principles of experimental research. If you understand this, you understand the basis behind experimental research. I don't care how complex the experiment gets. If you understand this, you understand the basic premise and the idea behind experiment. So this is says a lot. This little diagram here speaks volumes about the basic premises under, underlying experiments. Experimental research isn't the only kind of research strategy that we use, but <coughs> it's certainly a valuable one because it allows us to determine cause and effect relation, like what's causing the behavior as opposed to just, I observe this behavior here, and I observe this other behavior, and they're correlated, except I don't know if one's causing the other one. 
They just show up together. Correlation. But with experiments, I can figure out this thing here causes this over here. And, um, and that is the goal of an experiment. So now you know what a independent variable is. Now you know what a dependent variable is. There are some other things called subject variables. We've talked about those. There's some other things called extraneous variables or confounding variables. Uh, I said that these two groups are the same at the beginning of the experiment. But if any conditions change between this group and this group, either external or in the composition of the group, then your experiment is confounded, as we say. It's confused. The results are not <coughs> clear. Suppose that for this group, the temperature, uh, when I ran these subjects, the temperature just so happens the air conditioner broke that month. And while I was collecting this data, it was 105 degrees in the classrooms when they were learning. And then their grades went down. Now my question is, did my new method cause their grades to go down? No. No. Well, what do you think caused it to go down? Temperature. And really, the best answer is you don't know. It could be the temperature. It could be my teaching method. How do you figure this out? You can't. Start over. Start over and make sure the air conditioner is working the next time. <coughs> That's it. <coughs> but we call that experiment confounded, confused. The results are not clear. Now, research that involves large groups of subjects, page 18 in your book, we call nomothetic research. Where, you, where you're looking at large groups of subjects and trying to come up with general principles that you can apply to other uh, groups, we call that nomothetic. If you're studying one person over time, like Freud did, Sigmund Freud, we call those cases. That's called ideographic research. Ideographic research versus nomothetic. They're both legitimate research strategies. It's just that they're different. Uh, all right. You need to know just some general principles about research here. Yeah, moving along. Oh, I see they do that soon. Like the popper still in this edition. Okay, very good. Now, um, science is, is and how science gets done is actually uh, uh, theoretical. And um, you can find books on the theory of science kind of thing, whether it makes sense to adopt that, that approach to learning about the world. But uh, in any event, there are these two uh, researchers, theoreticians, a guy named Thomas Kuhn and another one named Karl Popper toward the end of chapter two. And, over. and uh, Thomas Kuhn says, he, his approach is this, that he maintains that uh, we really don't make much progress by conducting these little individual experiments, which most of us do. And you look at empirical journals in psychology, you'll see it's a whole collection of, we look at, you know, you may read some research articles sometimes and wonder, what's up with this? The, you know, only, they only had left-handed females with uh, six years of education that are going to, you know, press little keys to see what effect it has on the such and such, you know, and you're going, what in the world? Who's interested in that? Very specific. Well, the literature is full of those kinds of studies where somebody is looking at some very specific aspect of the world to see how it affects people. And uh, that kind of experimentation, Thomas Kuhn would say, doesn't get us very far. In fact, he would call that the, the mopping up operation. And, uh, but Thomas Kuhn says the way we make real progress in science is through revolutions, revolutionary ideas. And where we just sort of like upset the apple cart and uh, come up with a totally novel idea about the world, for example. Uh, can you think of any sort of um, revolutions in science that took one in particular that took place around the turn of the century uh, as we headed into the uh, 20th century, you know, late 1800s? Was there something that took place that just totally threw us for a loop? Like, you know, what? Can you think late 1800s biology? 1890s biology, uh, major 
paradigm shift, as we call it, a major shift in the model of how we look at human beings. Thank you, Charles Darwin. That's exactly right. Where you said, oh, we just, we're descended. We evolved from all kinds of creatures going all the way back to the primordial soup. You know, some little animals crawled out of the primordial soup. One-celled organisms and then two-celled organisms and then larger and larger and larger. And then here we are, you know, a few billion years later. Uh, whatever. Uh, Okay, well that was that was Darwin. I mean, that's a major shift in the way we thought about things, and it's still a hotly debated topic even today. Today, it's still hotly debated. Creationism. Oh, God created the world in seven days and then He rested, and that's how we got here. And God created you and me, and that's it. There, I've spoken. <laughs> that's the method of tenacity we were talking about. There are a lot of people that believe that. There are a lot of people that still promote that. And they will go to their grave defending that. And you're saying, oh, no, you know, we evolved. We all, we've all accepted evolution, the theory of evolution. No, we have not. And uh, I, I'm not going to mention specific examples. You just keep that in mind the next time you hear people talking about, particularly it's a hotly debated topic in politics. Like, for example, should that be included? Should we include creationism or, you know, intelligent design versus evolution? Should we include both in a textbook of history in public school? That's hotly debated. And guess who decides what gets put in textbooks and what textbooks we're going to use in public education? School boards. And school board members, how, how do they get there? They're elected. Um, how many of you ever heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial? Check that out. Google that sometime in Scopes Monkey Trial and see what see what you come up with there. There was a guy, did we talk about this already? Yeah. Uh, there's a road over there near Mission, in Mission, named after the one of the attorneys that was involved in the Scopes Monkey Trial. You know who that is? Bryan. William Jenny Bryant. That's right. Very famous politician, ran for president one time. Anyway, William James Bryan, as Bryan Wood is named after because he lived down here, I think, for just a very short time. Uh, he was one of the attorneys defending creative design, creationism, and all that in the Scopes Monkey Trial. <coughs> anyway, they fired a teacher for teaching evolution around the turn of the century. Anyway, uh, check it out. Real interesting. So... <coughs> Uh, Kuhn says that we make progress by having these major revolutions. Well, I guarantee you that was a revolution. It still kind of is. The, 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 the battle, the war is still going on. Um, and maybe can we think of one in psychology where you'd say, hey, there's somebody that really shook the foundation or really created a whole new way of looking at human behavior. Uh, you haven't had this class yet, so maybe you, you wouldn't think of it, but... Uh, in my opinion, John Watson, we're going to talk about in great detail, who said that we should only be studying overt observable behavior and consciousness doesn't exist. Yeah, that's a major paradigm shift. What? You mean, I don't, you mean there's nobody in my head talking to me? Nope. They, you know, the only thing that counts is overt observable behavior. That flies in the face of constructivism and mentalism that, you know, is sort of popular in education, public education today. <coughs> But uh, these battles are still going on, you know. You've got to look for where the science is, where the evidence is. Um, I think that that's a little naive. Well, John Watson, if you look closely, what he, he, didn't, he doesn't deny thinking. He just denies consciousness as a little person in your head talking to you. And uh, he says, when you're dead, you're dead all over like Wilbur. <laughs> that's it. Uh, so there's, a, there's, I think, a paradigm shift. You know, maybe another paradigm shift might have been in psychology, the sort of cognitive psychology, I, I would call it almost a revolution, where, which then was reacting against Watson. Oh, no, we're not automata, they're just unthinking machines going through life. We, we think, we feel, we have free will. Humanistic psychology, that was a movement in the 1960s. And uh, what was going on in the 1960s? Let's take a look at the zeitgeist. 
In the 1960s in psychology, well, I mean, zeitgeist, that's a German word that means the thinking of the time, the zeitgeist. What was the zeitgeist in the 1960s? Maybe you read in your history books. I don't see anybody in here that looks like they lived through the 60s other than me. And they say if you can remember the 60s, you couldn't have been there because <laughs> of the drugs. <laughs> The zeitgeist in the 1960s, <laughs> believe it or not, I had hair down to here. I was Joe Hippie all the way. Yeah, I was Joe Hippie all the way, and I wore big bell-bottom pants, and I had big platform shoes. I, mean, I looked like Tommy, you know, the pinball wizard, you know. And, uh, and my, totally, my parents were totally humiliated during my hippie period, uh, you know. And then I grew up and decided, you know, this long hair thing, it's too much trouble to take care of, so I just didn't cut it short, and that was that. Um, but um, I remember they had their silver wedding anniversary, and, and there I was in all my glory. And, uh, and I look back now on those photos, and I'm going, oh, my God, my poor parents, how could I do that? To them? <laughs> but what I was, I was like all late adolescents wanting to make a point, you know, it's like, um, rebelling a little bit, you know, we all try on different hats in adolescence, you know, am I a hippie, you know, am I a bad boy, am I an intellectual, what am I, you know, trying to find your way, so, so uh, I think that, that, uh, you know, during that period, that during my hippie period, uh, I was trying to make a point, you know, I'm radical, and, you know, and hippie, no, you know, um, but, um, something I was going to point I was going to make about that. Uh, oh, and I remember people reacting to me negatively because I had the really long hair. And that just reinforced keeping the long hair because I thought, they shouldn't judge me. How can they judge me by my long hair? <laughs> Guess what, folks? First impressions are really important in psychology. And we, this is just the way people act. We form quick impressions of other people right away. First impressions are important. And so, well, that shouldn't be that way. Well, yeah, maybe not, but that is the way the world works. So uh, I hate to tell you, but that's the way it works. And, uh, and so anyhow, after a while, I kind of gave up the battle and just said, yeah, okay. <laughs> I did my part. Well, anyway, so uh, humanistic psychology, the zeitgeist at the time was free will and peace and love, man, and don't, don't, you know, don't trust anybody over 30. Expand your mind. Timothy Leary, LSD, hashish, you know. Uh, let's grow in here personally. And, um, and so at that time, humanistic psychology, I would say, was a bit of a revolution. Also, we, we, revolting against the mechanistic, behavioristic notion of animals and people of the 1940s and 50s. So psychology, in my opinion, has had a number of different sort of revolutions. And then so Karl Popper or uh, Thomas Kuhn would say, oh, now we're making, now we're getting somewhere, you know. Karl Popper, on the other hand, is very much in favor of this, his principle, which you need to know for the test, of falsification. That is falsifying hypotheses. You know, science progresses through negative proof. You don't prove anything. What you do is you either fail or, or, or not to support the null hypothesis with hypothesis testing. But you can't say, well, let's say that my experimental group here caused courses, course grades to go down. Can I say, well, so this new teaching method here causes grades to go down for all time, for all people? Yeah. New. For the moment until somebody comes along and knocks the bricks out of my study. And so we falsify these hypotheses that we have, no hypothesis, and then we keep on going until somebody else comes along and falsifies what we found out. Science is a little bit like uh, archaeology, I think, in that, you know, you dust off. Experiments are like dusting off the bones. And, and you keep dusting things off. And hey, what does that dinosaur look like? Oh, we just have to keep going. And I'll, oh, that's what they look like. Oh, we're not finished yet. We've got to dust off more and more and more. And then ultimately the truth is down there somewhere. You dust off enough, conduct enough experiments. Ultimately, you get at the ultimate truth down there somewhere. Um, and science is a little bit like that, in my opinion. 
It's the slow accumulation of bits and pieces of information that gets synthesized into theories and, and then we keep moving. Now, you know, Kuhn would just simply say, well, okay, that's all well and good, but you're really not making any progress until you, you completely change the way we think about it. I'm waiting for the next big revolution, the next big paradigm shift. I don't know when that's going to come. I suspect it's going to come somewhere either in subatomic particle physics or and or computers. Somewhere, somewhere in there, somebody's going to come up with something like a new method for making energy that we haven't come up with yet, like cold fusion or something like that. Or somebody's going to come up with uh, some totally new way of, I don't know, maybe we'll evolve into creatures where we actually can have mental telepathy or something. You know, I don't know. We'll see. Might be a very long time, though. But uh, we'll see. But the way computers... The fact that computer information and technology doubles, what is it, like every 18 months or something, makes me think that something really big is going to come out of that stuff. Maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, yeah, maybe in your lifetime, something really radical, a radical idea. Well, anyhow, that's uh, those are their ideas. And uh, principle of falsification, or reputation, re refutability, um, Popper and Kuhn. Different ideas about science, but we're using science in here and learning theorists have used science to try and figure out what causes you to change your behavior and to learn. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, I'm just waiting for somebody to say, could you repeat all that? <laughs> anyway, chapter three. We talked about some of these philosophers, I think. Did we not talk about Plato, Aristotle? Yeah, went through all that. I said you didn't have to know the, you know, you really need to know chapter three up through the first few pages over to, over to, um, uh, let's say, page 12. Well, Rene Descartes. You should read up through Rene Descartes. I, I'm not going to ask you to memorize the British empiricists, you know, Hobbes, Hume, Locke. Berkeley. Yeah, it's interesting reading, but the bottom line is, by the way, all of those theorists, starting with uh, starting with Thomas Hobbes, were known as the British empiricists. They were British philosophers that, uh, you know, in the 17th and 18th century, that had had ideas, different ideas about how we learn, but they they all had a common denominator, and that was that somehow we get information through our senses, then we do stuff with it. That's the common denominator for all of the British empiricists, but they have different ideas about it. You should know about John Locke, though, and his tabula rasa. That's something you probably even have read about. How many of you have heard of John Locke and tabula rasa? Several of you, yeah. Um, what he said is that we're born like a blank slate. That's the tabula rasa, blank slate. And as you experience the world, things get written on that blank slate. So. Was he a big-time rationalist? No, big-time empiricist. Uh, we get information through our senses, and it gets written on the blank slate. Would, would he be considered a nativist? Remember nativism, you're born with knowledge? No. What about him? No, absolutely not. Uh, you're a blank slate, and that's how you learn. Experience. Well... I think we'll skip over. I didn't bring my, I have a fine built of doll head. I didn't bring it down. I don't think it's important. We can skip all the way over, I think, to maybe page 41. And just talk about a few of these early schools of thought, which I've been kind of talking about. But on page 41, the early schools of thought in psychology, you should know that for the test. We're talking about voluntarism. Bill and Boone. Did I, did we already talk about him? No. After the British empiricists, some other folks followed, like Franz Joseph Gall and uh, Herman Ebbinghaus, Charles Darwin. It's the late 1800s now. And um, science is coming into vogue. I mean, really coming into vogue now. Well, the concept of operationism was anyway in the late 1800s. A guy named Bridgman. And that you should 
operationally define the terms that you're, you know, the science, the concept of science goes back much further than that. Uh, Bacon and some other people. Uh, but, but anyway, in psychology took off as a separate discipline, separate discipline, and started with, they say, 1879 with Wilhelm Boone. You probably learned this in your intro psych class. And um, Wilhelm Boone had the first lab designed to study human behavior scientifically. So these, these schools of thought uh, came about. And a school of thought is simply a group of people that share similar ideas. That's why it's called a school of thought. Now, these people can be in the same physical location, but they don't necessarily need to be. But a school of thought are people that share the same thinking. And maybe the earliest one in psychology was voluntarism, Bill M. Boone. He had that first laboratory designed specifically to study human behavior in 1879. In fact, he's called the father of scientific psychology, not Sigmund Freud. Freud was non-scientific. Wilhelm Boone, Leipzig, Germany, 1879. He had something actually called the thought meter. He was going to measure the speed of human thought. I wonder if they even mention that in here. I don't see it. Anyway, it was like this. There's a clock. had a pendulum down here that uh, swung back and forth with a stylus on it like this and a measurement <coughs> scale and over here we have a bell my bells look like pears or something I'm terrible at drawing my dad was an artist by profession I wanted to be an artist so much uh, I took art classes. It was a miserable failure. I mean, uh, everybody else's stuff in class always looked so much better than mine. You know, I just, it was just like, oh, this isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So then my dad decided, well, son, I think because you like art, you should go into printing. <laughs> printing? <laughs> well, yes, it involves paint and ink and stuff like that. And you can make a good living as a master printer. This is Cleveland, Ohio. This is like apprenticeships. This is, you know, blue collar stuff. Uh, you become a journeyman and an apprentice, and then you become a master, whatever it is, plumber, boiler maker. In this case, it was printer. And so I went to the local junior college and was taking courses in printing. Hated it. I wasted an entire semester at this place learning about ink. <laughs> and uh, and we, went deep. we did field trips to local, like American Greetings is in Cleveland. Would go there and look at the big printing machines, knocking out these cards and stuff, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> it was just like, this is not for me. I'm sorry, you know. But um, so anyway, but I can't. You know, that's my drawing skill right there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my apparently my daughter inherited my dad's draftsman skills, but me. Forget it. So anyway, this this clock the pendulum would move back and forth, swing back and forth, and as it would, these stylus here would hit the bell when it swung over that way, and then would come back and swing over here. And then what he did was he took note along the measurement scale of the location of the, the pendulum at the exact minute it touched the bell and at the exact moment that the subject said, I hear the bell. And what he found was there was actually a very, very slight difference between when it touched the bell and when they said, I hear the bell. And so he used that time differential to figure out the speed of thought. Now, it wasn't accurate, but a very interesting way to empirically uh, figure out how fast you think. What I like about some of these early uh, experiments is that and people just sit there and, like Edison, just come up with ways of, how am I going to measure this? Okay, let me just come up with a contraction that will do it. I think that's really cool. It's like Edison, you know, after he failed like a thousand times and met the light bulb, he said, well, now I know I have a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. Until uh, <laughs> you hit the right. But it's nifty the way these guys come up with this. And I think the same thing applies to today. Um, I like it. that part of science and psychology gets me excited, trying to figure out how do I solve this problem? How do I do this thing, you know? 
Well, he was interested in the voluntary nature of behavior, which is why this is called voluntarism, although you'll see some books that will say he taught that he was the came up with structuralism, but that was actually one of his students, a British psychologist named E. B. Titchener, Edward Titchener, uh, structuralism. Another school of thought. misspelling Titchener's name. No. Oh yeah, there's a T. I always forget that T. Titchener. D.B. Titchener. He came up with something called structuralism. And what he was interested in was the structure of consciousness. Break consciousness down into its most smallest parts. Because at that time, the zeitgeist at that time was, if you want to understand something, you take it apart. Take it apart, dissect it. Oh, well then we can take consciousness and dissect that into its smallest parts. So he was interested in the structure of consciousness. Wundt was interested in the voluntary nature of behavior. And uh, Titchener actually was a student of Wundt, and so was William James. Leipzig was like a sort of a magnet for people that were interested in these things in the early days. And um, structuralism didn't hang around very long. Because um, here's an experiment. Here's a Titchenerian experiment. Well, all right, Dr. Winslow, uh, I'll keep you Titchener. I want you to, by the way, they used a method called introspection. You need to know that. Maybe you've heard that term before, introspection, where you look inward, study your inner thoughts, introspect. Okay, I want you to report to me. I want you to introspect and tell me what you see here. All right. Can we talk about this? All right, I see a room full of students. Oh, you've made what he calls a stimulus error. You're labeling these, this experience. Students? That's not the most basic element of consciousness. All right, let's try it again. All right, I see a room full of colors, red, blue, green. Oh, no, 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 no. You're labeling these things again. Red, green, and blue. Those are colors. That's... All right, uh, let me try it again. All right, I see patches of light and dark, patches of light and dark. Okay, now we're making some progress. And you're sitting there going, well, that's stupid. I see a room full of people wearing different color clothing. Yes, so this didn't hang around very long. Uh, <laughs> because it was going nowhere, you know. That's not how we act. Structuralism, you got Freud over, and, you know, and in uh, Austria doing his thing and uh, with his psychodynamic theory. And then you had the Gestalt psychologists. They don't even mention them in here, but there was a group in the 1920s. We're going to talk about them, by the way, so I'll mention them right now. The Gestalt movement. Gest by the way, that's a German word that means whole. The Gestalt psychologists would say this. They would say, well, what, what, what passes a light and dark? That's nonsense. Um, here, what do you see when I draw that? Just tell me. Thank you. You see patches of light and dark there? No, you saw a triangle. And now what do you see? Ice cream. Oh, a cone, probably a snow cone or something like that. Yeah, you don't see patches of light and dark. You, don't, you didn't say, well, I see a semicircle. You know, this, uh, or a, a solid white half of a, a, a circle that's connected to this triangle. And uh, I, I see a triangle, I see a cone. Probably like one of the, what do they call them? Uh, snowballs, or uh, there was some little stand out here, they were called the snow whiz. There was one that was called the snow whiz. That never sounded really so like something I wanted to try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, growing up in Cleveland in the wintertime, it would snow a lot. Oh, I'll leave, I'll leave the rest of the story. <laughs> the snow wind was something I wanted to have, you know. But anyway, a snow cone. And uh, you saw that right away. We'll talk about the Gestalt again. So they were reacting against, they were revolting against the structural, structural group. I don't know, they were just had different ideas. They were revolting against that. Then, here come the functionalists. Functionalism. Who founded that? 
William James. It's an American brand of psychology. The first sort of American brand of psychology, William James. Uh, he was a, he went over and studied with books, and then he comes back to the U.S. and starts this. He was at Harvard. And uh, William James, functionalism. They were influenced by Darwin because they were interested in the functions of behavior. Does behavior have some functions? Does it, does it serve humans in, or actually any organism in some way? Was consciousness okay for them to study? Yes, as long as it has some <coughs> function. If it serves some function, they were interested in it. Like intelligence. Does that have any function? Well, that might be something they'd be interested in. So the functionalists were very pragmatic, very practical minded, influenced by Darwin, American brand of psychology here. These are Germans, uh, British, German, America. Following functionalism, uh, well, actually, and the tail end of functionalism when Gestalt came on the scene in the early 1920s and 30s. And um, then we move on down the road. Here comes behaviorism. John Watson. John Watson, he kept along and said, no, we shouldn't be studying consciousness at all. Overt observable behavior. There you go. Okay, this is in the 1940s. I have a picture of Watson here on page 44 in your book. And um, so they were rejecting anything that had he was and the other behaviors were rejecting anything that had anything to do with consciousness. So they were rejecting the Gestalt psychologists, structuralism, um, and uh, any of those notions, or in any part of it that the functionalists, when they were interested in the mind or consciousness, reject all of that. Um, okay, so we got behaviorism, which we're going to talk about in some detail um, at the end of the uh, catalog. Okay, what came after behaviorism? Just to bring you up, just to finish it off. I think they stopped with behaviorism in here, but just to, so you're complete. Following the behaviors came the humanistic psychology. <coughs> humanistic psychology. Humanistic psychology. Uh, we're talking about Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow. 1960s. The hippie generation. Free will. Peace and love. Oh, you, you're having problems psychologically? That's because nobody's loving you enough. Uh, unconditional positive regard. You're having problems because you have not been given unconditional love. Unconditional positive regard. Well, I just robbed the bank. Oh, well, that's not so great, but I love you anyway. I love you for who you are. You have worth as a human being. That's it. According to Rogers, if everybody <coughs> showed everybody else unconditional positive regard, we'd have no problems, no psychological <laughs> problems. And it comes from uh, humanistic psychology. And having psychological problems, according to humanistic psychologists and existential <coughs> psychologists, it's because you're leading an inauthentic life. You need to embrace your anxiety and your life and make decisions and stand by them, and then you will lead an authentic life, and then you will be happy. But if you lie and deceive yourself and do not accept responsibility for your actions, you'll be leading an authentic life. You will not experience happiness. And you need to get loved by everybody, no matter what you did. Now you're saying, oh, well, well, I like everybody. I love everybody. No, even your own family members. What I would say is you are constantly putting conditions on them for your love. And they're constantly doing it to you. Well, uh, maybe the child comes running and says, "Well, I, I want some, uh, I want some candy before uh, before dinner, and maybe eats candy or a cookie or something." And the mother says, "You've spoiled your appetite now. You're not going to eat any dinner, and I'm very angry with you. And so I'm not going to love you unless you behave the way I want you to. And so you should not eat those cookies anymore, or I will be angry with you." 
That's not unconditional love. Unconditional love would say, well, you may not be that hungry at dinner time, but I still love you. That's fine, I love you, but maybe you know, it would be better if you didn't eat before that. But that, that sort of angry, and I'm not going to like you unless you behave the way I Hey, uh, let's go see a movie. Okay, so uh, so the girlfriend says, the, good boy, the guy says, well, hey, what do you want to see? And she goes, well, I want to see Brad Pitt and falls in love with the great Harlequin romance novel thing, you know. And it's just so lovely. And I've been dying to see it. And the guy's gone, oh. And she says, well, what do you want to see? And he says, well, I want to see the uh, Star Wars and read the sci-fi uh, planet of the uh, superpower, you know, um, metal, metal mania. What's the, oh, Transformer. Guys, <laughs> that's what I want to see. And then she goes, oh. <laughs> that's not unconditional positive regard. That's, I am not going to reward you or give you my love until you say what I want you to hear, what I want to hear. And then the guy goes, oh, well, you, you don't want to see that? No. <laughs> but you'd like to see this other thing. <laughs> and if you take me, I will love you. I will give you my love. <laughs> yes, that's the way it works. <coughs> the way it works. The way it works. <coughs> so I think that's a tough, that's a tough order to fill. Unconditional positive regard. Uh, we took a vacation. I was at Universal Studios this summer in Orlando, and I gotta tell you, if you get there, that uh, what made me think of it was the uh, the Transformer thing, mm -hmm. new ride there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what they do with the 4D stuff now. Un unbelievable. I mean, I thought there was this Transformer guy in my face. Right there. You know, I'm like, yes, sir. Yeah. Anybody have been on that ride yet? I guess it's just over there. If you get there, you know, this is good. You've got to see that. Over the top, realistic. Humanistic psychology. All right. Any other schools of thought after them in the 1960s? Not really. Uh, Biopsychology, well, cognitive psychology for sure came on the scene in the late 60s. Cognitive psychology, it's not really a school of thought, it was a movement away from this mechanistic, the mechanistic ideas of behavior and saying, yeah, well, that's all well and good, but you know, most of what we do happens up here. Thinking, therefore, we should be studying mostly what we do up here. Don't worry about the middle reward and the bonus exactly. It's what we do is think. And so cognitive psychology really took off in the late 60s, heading into the 70s. In fact, I just found out about a decade ago that uh, the textbook I used in cognitive psych when I was an undergraduate was written by a guy named Ulrich Meiser. And it was like the first book written on cognitive psychology. But I didn't know it at the time. How's a psych major like you? I don't know. It's a, another cognitive psych book. No, it was like the cognitive psych book at the time. Uh, like in the late 60s. Cognitive psych, then biopsych. Um, biopsych uh, became popular about the same time as cognitive. And then um, neuropsych, kind of very popular area today. And uh, now also kind of related to the cognitive thing is that people are interested in something called theory of mind. Now, we really kind of come full circle on this thing. Uh, now we're back to how the mind works. And also something called positive psychology. It's, a, it's one of a movement in psychology that was started by some well-known social psychologists in the last decade. They were saying, you know, instead of focusing on what's wrong with people, we should focus on resiliency and what's right with humans. And let's make that like a centerpiece. And it's called positive psychology. So those are all sort of different sort of movements in psychology. I wouldn't say they're schools of thought. That's maybe what I would say is the last school of thought. And, and then we just move into where the emphasis in psychology is. And so neuropsych, positive psych, uh, that's where it is. And the mind, this whole theory of mind thing is pretty popular in some circles. Constructivism and the theory of mind. And there's a new theory out there. It's called the ACT Therapy. And, uh, and it involves this idea that it, part of this ACT Therapy is called mindfulness 
and that is being aware of how you react emotionally to situations or being mindful of that. That's a facet, that's a component of ACT therapy, which is sort of one of the latest theories in therapy in psychology. And it seems like it's getting some support for being pretty special in treating things like depression. Um, anyhow, you can check that out. We just hired a new psychologist here. Her name's uh, Maureen Flint. This is her area. And we're very lucky, I think, to have her here because she's sort of on the cutting edge of this new type of a therapy. And uh, in fact, uh, I've asked her, several of us have asked her to develop a graduate course in ACT therapy specifically because it's getting some traction. So anyway, uh, there you have it. So that finishes up chapter two. You got a thumbnail sketch of how we got here and how you do experiments. And